Uh, my name is Dan Gibbons. I'm a member of the Holiday City Council representing District 5. We also have uh, <clears throat> here in person Paul Allred, who is um, our recent uh, planning community development uh, director, and he has a new title. It's probably something emeritus <laughs> uh, something. So anyway, Paul is remaining uh, with the city during it in a, on an interim basis and handling a few big projects, including this one. We also have Mayor uh, Rob Daly, who's with us, and we want, like to welcome everybody who's monitoring this, particularly the uh, landowners and or tenants who are part of the uh, project that uh, has been proposed by the Planning Commission for a holiday crossroads zone. We thought it important to get some input and uh, have an opportunity for landowners to ask questions and express their views in addition to the open houses where we've had uh, input from the citizens. And so uh, again, this is, a, <clears throat> this is a proposal that is right now before the Holiday City Council. Uh, the proposal has come all the way up through the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission has recommended the adoption of a new zone designation called the Holiday Crossroads Zone. Uh, it, uh, uh, there, there, on the city website is a copy of all of the documentation, including the proposed ordinance. Uh, Paul Allred now will uh, give us a, an overview of the zone, and uh, we'd then like to entertain questions and receive comments from anyone who is interested. And as Stephanie mentioned, if you'd like to comment, just raise your virtual hand and uh, we'll let you in to make some comments. So thanks again for being with us, Paul. Thank you, Councilman Gibbons. And I really appreciate all the support that you and Mayor Daly have, uh, uh, have given to um, uh, the Planning Commission, the city can and, the, uh, and the staff to get this done and really appreciate you both participating today. Um, there's a ton of stuff we could talk about here, but um, we're gonna focus kind of on big picture issues and uh, talking about the Holiday Crossroads Zone. Thank you, Stephanie, for uh, bringing this first graphic up. So let me just give you a little background on how all this works. In 2016, the, the city of Holiday adopted an update to its overall master plan. Um, but the ter technical term is a general plan. So the general plan talks about a lot of things, but most of it is planning, land use, uh, transportation, um, and housing related. So it's kind of a blueprint for where the city's going to go in the future. And it is a, it is a flexible guide. It's, some people like to call it a living document because it's not set in stone. The general plan is something that all cities in Utah have and that are required to have. And there are three specific elements that are required by state law to be included in the general plan. And they are land use or planning and zoning, uh, housing, a plan for housing going forward. And the other one is transportation. Now uh, this next screen here gives you a little bit of background. Again, we adopted a new plan in 2016. The original one was done in uh, the end of 2005, or excuse me, 1999 when the city incorporated. And then it has been adopted, it has been amended here and there uh, from time to time for various issues that come up. So one of the things that we did with this uh, rewrite or update of the general plan in 2016 was we, we launched into about an 18 month effort to look at uh, how things are working overall in the city. And one of the things that we decided that needed to be done was to kind of refresh or take a new look at our commercial areas. And in particular, this one, because as any of you know who are listening in today and participating, um, we only have a few significant commercial areas in the city. Uh, this is one of them. The other ones are, you know, the Holiday Village area, which has seen a complete change since, uh, you know, starting in about 2006 or seven, things started to move, but it's only been in the last few years that it's really taken off. And that kind of gives you a feel for how growth and development can occur when the city changes its view or its vision. The old downtown area, when the city incorporated, um, the city leaders, uh, back at that time, uh, the end of the uh, uh, 
the 1990s, right around the turn of the century, decided that Holiday's traditional downtown needed a makeover. And this was really critical for the long range future of the city. And then of course, uh, the Cottonwood Mall area, which is now known as Holiday Hills, is our most significant commercial area. And then you have the Holiday Crossroads, which some people tend to overlook because it's a bit old. Um, it was really developed well before the city uh, was incorporated. And it was incorporated with zoning that we inherited from Salt Lake County. So when the city incorporated, we kind of adopted a lot of the stuff they had because we didn't have the staff or the ability to do it all at the same time. We have some other small commercial areas around the city, uh, but the next other large and significant one is the area at uh, near Wasatch and 6200 South, 30th East, the Mill Rock area. So these are our commercial nodes, but this one uh, happens to be right on our gateway. It's, it might be our biggest gateway to the city is because it's right by 215. And so one thing that we decided to do was to look for ways to uh, adopt a new plan for that area. We put in for a grant, we got some money, we hired a couple of very good consultants to help the city, Dr. Joe Perrin, who is a landscape, who, excuse me, is a transportation expert and Bruce Parker, who is very well known for his land use planning skills. Those two gentlemen together with uh, a committee that we had, as well as um, the staff and the public, we went through uh, an extensive period of reviewing this area and deciding what needed to be done. And one thing that became very apparent was that kind of what was there uh, isn't bad, but we could really use uh, a makeover here. Uh, and because it's near our gateway, the city really wanted to accomplish kind of a new vision there. So we adopt the general plan, then we came up with what's called a small area master plan. And this small area master plan was a, a deliberate attempt to look at a very small area. Stephanie, would you please bring back that graphic uh, again, in case anybody's joined us. The area that's highlighted with the blue outline, this was the area that was studied for the small area master plan. And of course, across the street to the west, which is left on your screen, is the city of Murray. And then um, you can see Highland Drive come down. It does a little bit of a dog leg as it connects to Van Winkle. And then you see I-215. Because this is so close uh, to, the, um, to the interstate there, it's very important to look at the best way to make this area uh, work well for the city in the long term. So the small area master plan, if you'll go back to that uh, other screen, Stephanie, um, uh, was uh, looked at in the, in, again, the small area master plan. It calls for a new vision. And the, but the small area master plan, just like the general plan is not a zone. Sometimes people get confused about a plan versus a zone. So when I say a general uh, plan, it means that it's not binding. It means that the recommendations in that plan aren't binding, but for that vision to be uh, developed, you have to have a vehicle for it. And that is the Holiday Crossroads zone. Just like the mall has a special zone, the Holiday Hills area has a special zone. Um, this has a special zone that's been proposed now. And uh, this is what the council is looking at. So we'll try to just touch on the basis, basics of it today. But what really occurred is that once the small area master plan was done, uh, not long after that, a property owner in that area said, that they would like to do something with their property, something different than the zone that's there now. The zone that's there now used to be the same zoning for the mall, for the uh, commercial area across the street from the mall, both to the north and to the west. And a lot of the city's general commercial areas are what's called a C2 zone. A uh, C2 zone allows a ton of different uses. But in this case, where this uh, area is so close to the freeway and it's such an important gateway, if you will, uh, one of our council members suggested that we use the term crossroads, which I think is really a, a great way of thinking about this property. So the crossroad, holiday crossroads zone has been proposed. And until this zone is adopted, the existing zone, zone that's there now continues to be uh, the, the rule. It has the rules for what we can do there. So we got this old zone that we inherited from Salt Lake County, but one of the problems with the existing C2 zone is that it's pretty limited, it's, it's restrictive in some ways, and it's, it, it just doesn't work for a long range look at, at that area. 
So just as you see, the mall is going a bit more vertical. The Holiday Village, you're seeing buildings that are taller than what was there before. Um, that's a function of two or three things. One, uh, property values. Uh, and another one is um, the economic impact that can occur if you allow buildings a little bit taller. Uh, traffic patterns are not going to change much. But um, so you will see a little more verticality and that's just something that happens over a period of time. Um, it's just a function of geography and a function of, of transportation. So this new zone that's been proposed, the Holiday Crossroads Zone, really kind of just um, creates a completely new way of looking at the land use there while looking at the constraints that are already there too. The real purpose of this zone is to create opportunity. And right now the C2 zone, because it has a height limit of only 35 feet, it's, it's really outdated. That is perhaps one of the biggest restrictions of the C2 zone that, uh, that, that the city looked at when it adopted the small area master plan. So um, the small area master plan said, hey, this is a special area. We need to look at having a bit more of an economic impact. Right now that area, or uh, it, it's, it constitutes about $1.06 of the revenue that comes into the city. So 13, 14, 15%, and slightly less than $1.06, but it, it brings in a lot of revenue, even though it doesn't seem like it's very big centers because it's kind of scattered buildings are kind of low, they sit back from the street. So um, as, you, as in it, most of us know, you see new development going on around the county and other cities, you're seeing a lot of uh, buildings that are, uh, that are taller and more substantial. So here's some key elements of the zone that may be of most interest. And, and number one is that this allows for uh, buildings that are significantly taller in the proposed zone, it's not adopted yet, but if approved, as it's currently drafted, this zone would allow buildings to go about the same height as Macy's on the Holiday Hills, the old mall site. That building's around 60 feet. The Planning Commission recommended that in this case, at the gateway there with Holiday Crossroads, uh, 65 feet would be appropriate. Um, it, it, but, it, but one interesting part of this, though, is that we understand that sometimes taller buildings are, are difficult for people to accept. They, they, there's some there's a component of, um, of change that with that the people don't like so much. So what the real idea here was is if you're going to allow for taller buildings, then you would want to keep them away from any of those abutting residential areas. Now, in this case, what we have both south and north of 6200, you have a neighborhood um, just behind it where most of the homes are uh, they're a bit older and they're fairly short. Not a lot of two-story homes there, correct, Dan? Uh, your neighborhood, a lot of, lot of fairly uh, vertically challenged homes, I would say. That, is that, would that be correct, Dan? Yeah. Not a lot of two-stories? Yeah, that's, <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's true. It's, uh, in fact, it's the neighborhood directly east of, uh, well, there are, two, there are two neighborhoods that we're dealing with, maybe three neighborhoods. One is sort of north, uh, and that's uh, smaller, you know, uh, sm smaller townhouse type dwellings directly east of the, 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 the square plot that's uh, north of 6200 South. Those are, those are more larger homes, maybe two, two and a half story homes. And then the area south of 6200 South is uh, everything east of there is, is basically ranch style, either single story or sort of uh, split level so that it's really one and a half stories. Yeah, and, and in particular, the one south of 6200, those homes are a little bit older. And again, they, they are a little more low slung. And so the thought here was, was to create the ability for a property owner in this zone, this new proposed zone, to have a taller building. But those buildings would have to be further away from the neighborhoods. So if you look at this graphic that Stephanie has put up there, you'll see that the area in red, um, that's an area that's 200 feet wide. And in that area, as you'll read right down below in the graphic, it says anything within that area has to be no more than 32 feet tall, which is about the height of a more contemporary two-story home with a, with a pitched roof on it. So, and we also looked at this in terms of compatibility 
because that height is the same height maximum that's allowed for those homes to the east, uh, which are zoned R18, which means single family with an 8,000 square foot uh, property uh, size of your property. So what we wanted to create kind of a, uh, a graduated height. So taller near the streets. And as you got closer to the neighborhoods, it would drop down to no more than any of those homeowners in those neighborhoods could build under the law right now in an eight to 10,000, even a 15,000 square foot lot. So Paul, that was a uh, way to, yeah. Paul, if I could ask a question again, looking at the graphic with the red. Uh, so in the red, as I understand it, that would be limited to 32 feet under, under the new zone. And then, uh, but the larger buildings would still have to be graduated. In other words, you couldn't, you couldn't pop a, uh, a, a, a maximum height building right up to the red line. Do I, do I understand there still have to be some graduation back from that or? I think so. I think it uh, graduates to Rob Hobbs. I don't know if Rob has joined us, but Rob is my sidekick on this one, his staff. And if he's got the zone open and can connect and raise his hand, that would be great. But um, yeah, I don't think you can go right to 65 there, but, um, and, I, and I'm not sure that, that anybody really wants to go that tall there anyway, but we can double check that and make sure that's the case. Now, 65 at 200 feet, um, it'll still have some visual impact. So the further those taller buildings can be, the better. The way the zone is proposed is that those tall buildings should be up closer to the street where they have the, the least impact on residential areas and where they have the most ability to draw attention to the vehicles passing by. So and, Stephanie, and, if you- if, And Paul, on, Paul, if I could yes. just comment too, we, thanks, to, thanks to Paul's office, we've, we've verified that the, uh, the, the one office building that is across the street from this, across from the street from the little triangle, the one on the corner of Van Winkle and Vine Street, we verified that that is about 48 feet high. So just, just so that those who are listening, they can get an idea of, of the height um, that is suggested. Um, 40, 48 feet is the one sort of kitty corner from that little triangular piece. Dan, if I, if I could, I think actually Rob Hobbs, uh, Rob, if you can speak up here, I see you've joined us. I believe it's actually taller than that. Rob, would you like to comment? Can you comment on the actual height of that building on Vine. Okay. Um, the the real the the one that's a little bit taller that's a little bit more concern is actually the one that is straight across from the gas station, straight west. Um, if you could point to that one, Stephanie, uh, it's just north of the one that you were uh, pointing at. Okay, go go right there. That one is, is one that the Planning Commission discussed, and I think that one is taller. So you may be correct in the 48 feet, but I think the one uh, there that I'm looking at is a bit taller. And I think uh, Rob uh, was able to verify that today. Rob, are you able to comment? Yes, uh, the building that's sitting on Vine Street over in Murray's jurisdiction, we found to be 58 and a half feet tall. That one, and it, right? And the IHC building at 38 and a half feet. Okay, the IHC is a little bit further down, right? Yeah, keep going, Stephanie, yes. go down right yeah. there. That one, yeah, that one's right about a little bit under 40, but the one there uh, by the gas station straight west of the gas station is, is almost 60, Rob, is that what you said? That's correct. Okay, so as proposed, uh, Dan, the new zone would allow for buildings uh, slightly higher than that office building on Vine. But again, it would be for those buildings that, that uh, tend to front closer to the street. And um, that's, that's a really important uh, point to make. And by the way- Oh, and then if, 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 if uh, Rob Hobbs could also comment on the, is, is, so also there would be a graduated uh, elevation from the red zone. So in other words, you couldn't, you, you couldn't pop a 65 story building uh, right up to the red line. Is that correct, Rob? Councilman Gibbons, the way I read that is that the red zone, as is already stated, caps your building height at 32 feet. And in that area is where you have a graduated height requirement as well. 
where we look at a tapering effect uh, being possibly imposed depending on what structure height and mass uh, is placed within or proposed within that red area as juxtaposed against the neighborhood. But beyond that, in the area to the left or west of that in the graphic outside of the red area, in other words, uh, I don't see that yet we have a graduated height standard just to allow 65 feet as it says otherwise. And so uh, again, that's something that as we go through this process with council, uh, we can certainly obviously draw more attention to uh, in our discussions and continue to adjust the ordinance text uh, draft as we please. Thanks, Rob. We'll, we'll uh, before our public hearing continues on Thursday, uh, uh, Dan and Mayor Daly, we'll, we'll flesh that out a little bit more, but I think that's a really important point if the planning commission in their deliberations on this were, that's what they wanted to see. They wanted to see a, a, uh, a reduction or a transitional area between the tallest and the, uh, and the maximum in the red area, which again, surprisingly enough, most people aren't gonna build anywhere near 32, but it's about the height of a, of a two story with a pitch stroke on it. Um, Stephanie, can you go back to that graphic, uh, the one with the bullet points on it? Okay, these are key elements again. Uh, one of the big things that we haven't touched on yet is the idea of mixing uses together in the same building. If you look at most of Holiday's commercial zones right now, other than the village, hardly any of them, if any at all, have what's called commercial mixed residential use in the same building. It's either commercial or it's residential. But what we're seeing a lot now throughout uh, Utah, uh, it's really coming on as a trend, is the mixing of commercial and residential in the same building, which if you think about it, is a nod to the past. If you look at old pictures of um, Utah's uh, commercial nodes or its, its uh, centers where people did business, it was very common, of course, to have commercial on the bottom floor or two uh, topped by residential. That mixed use, again, is very traditional. And so this zone, just like the Holiday Village, would propose the allowance of commercial on the bottom with residential above or office above. But mixed use really connotes the idea of, of not mixing commercial uses together, but pure residential and commercial in the same building. So right now in the Holiday Village, what we have is most of the buildings are either commercial or residential. We do have one that technically has a commercial, uh, or we had, we had one for, uh, approved that never got built that had commercial and residential uh, in the same building. But what we have now with the Apollo project, where the old Apollo burger was, um, there is a, a three-story project being proposed that would have commercial on the main floor and then two stories of a residential above it. Uh, that building tops out at about 38 feet. So that is, true mixed use, and we're gonna see more of that um, in the Holiday Hills project, the old Cottonwood Mall will have a significant, in fact, virtually all of the residential uh, that you will see built over uh, the next five to 10 years in the Holiday Hills project will be, uh, will be residential dwellings above commercial or office on the main floor, and a lot of underground parking. So, um, this is again something that was done in the past. We got away from that when we went with more of a, you know, more of a car culture. But as we see um, land uses changing and property values going up, you do tend to see mixing of commercial and residential together. So this would be a third place in the city, uh, Holiday Hills, the, the Holiday Village, and the Holiday Crossroads area, um, if it's approved as proposed, would allow for mixed uses in the same building. They do tend to work together very well. It's just that we haven't seen a lot of it. Not many of us grew up in that kind of a situation, uh, but our grandparents and people before them did. So, um, and another significant component here. Oh, thank you, Stephanie, you were on the right graphic was, um, yeah, that one right there. If you look at the area that's shaded in blue, one of the key components of this new zone is um, uh, the proposal to have buildings closer to the street uh, we don't want them pushed way back. For example, the Excel building, uh, if you think about it, um, it sits several hundred feet back from Highland Drive and from 6200 South. Um, in the, that's called strip 
commercial. That's a, a kind of zoning that came, became very prevalent throughout the US post-World War II. The Cottonwood Mall was a prime example of that. And the Cottonwood Mall, when it was up, it, it was way back from the street. And so you had this huge parking lot between the street and the buildings. With the way that zoning is going now, one of the great things that, that we've done in the Holiday Village is moving those buildings closer to the street. It has, there's some real benefits to that. One, it, uh, it tends to slow traffic down. Psychologically, people go slower when buildings are closer to the street and hug the street. And it gives, it makes it for much more um, uh, walkable. It's desirable to walk in an area. Nobody wants to go walk uh, uh, where buildings are way back from the street. In a commercial area, they want to be able to see into the buildings. And um, it makes for, again, for a pleasant walking atmosphere. So where the village is pedestrian friendly, we'd like for the Holiday Crossroads area to have those buildings up closer to the street with a little bit of landscaping in front of them, but have buildings that have kind of a window to the street. One of the big mistakes that some areas make when they do mixed use in the same building is they, they tend to turn their back on the street. So the building may be close to the street, but it's just a bunch of blank walls. One of the really great ideas that we have in this Holiday Crossroads zone is to make sure that there are openings on the back of those buildings so that the building does not turn its back to the street and wall you off. Uh, it needs to be where the, the energy and the visuals of the site flow through buildings. So, and oh, thank you. Can you go back to that? Yeah, see the idea here. Now this is something that's, uh, you know, a graphic from another location, but you can see how welcoming uh, the corner is. So if you were to put this on the corner of 6200 South and uh, Highland Drive, kind of where the taco time is, by moving that building closer, what you get is you get openings on the bottom floor and you have uh, more of a uh, pedest uh, pedestrian atmosphere. And now we're not silly enough to think that people are gonna drive 10 miles an hour through the crossroads area just because there are buildings closer to the street. Now people will still go fast, but this will have uh, tend to have a calming effect and it tends to have a more of a welcoming effect, pushing the buildings back from the street and having the large parking lots. It's really quite unattractive, but we've gotten so used to it that we, we don't really notice it much until we have something built that's different. And if you go to the village, which all of us do, you'll notice how Taqueria 27, Harmons, um, that intersection there and the plaza, it really makes it for a pleasant atmosphere. You see a lot of kids, you see a lot of uh, school kids that are down there uh, walking around, congregating. There's just much more of a social uh, um, atmosphere and good architecture and good urban planning can have these soft but very um, measurable effects on traffic and on our mentality. So this is one idea. Stephanie, is there another graphic or two we could put up there to kind of give you a feel? Um, I think we had another one or two graphics, but Anyway, those are those are some of the the, the big ideas there, and um, we've been working on this for a while. Uh, we had a public hearing in December, uh, and just to let everybody know, we did send out for this particular event today, today at two, and again at uh, six o'clock tonight. We sent out just under a hundred uh, very nice color postcard type mailers to all of the property owners and the business owners and the tenants in those businesses in the Crossroads area to make sure that anybody who had a question could participate um, today, this evening, and then again um, on Thursday, uh, the council will be holding a continuation of the public hearing um, of what's been going on. So we're trying to do all that we can to get as much participation, as much content as we can. I think that kind of covers the, the big picture um, Mayor, Dan, Rob, anybody who's been participating, if there's something big that I've missed, would you, would you kind of join in and, and help me out here? And then we'll, we'll try to get questions from our, from those who are participating. No, Paul, I don't have anything further. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Great. Rob, anything that, that I missed? Uh, okay. Well, there's a lot of detail in this, things like landscaping, uh, parking. Oh, I guess we could touch on another component. Uh, one would be that here's one of the real problems that we have to deal with in our society today that we just take for granted. It's just there. And that is we, 
we tend to over park everything. So uh, even going to extremely busy uses like a Walmart, for most of the year, if you were to just put a camera on these parking lots 24 hours a day for 365 days straight and then do the math and count all of the stalls that were, that were how often they're occupied, most people would be floored. They'd be shocked to, to understand that a huge percentage of the parking stalls that are built with most uses throughout our country are done just with a basic um, rule of thumb. And that's usually four to five stalls per thousand square feet. And what you get are these gigantic parking lots that sit empty most of the time. What you really get is parking that's built for one to two days per year instead of parking that's built for the other 363. So the thought here, just like in the Holiday Village, is that we're looking for efficient parking, for um, uh, parking that has a, an economy of scale to it. And let me give you a prime example of why over parking is bad. There's several really important things to keep in mind here. One is over parking makes development much more expensive. It's very expensive to put down asphalt and then to uh, keep it uh, in good condition. You have to constantly scrape it, salt it in the winter time, move the snow around, and then the heating and cooling uh, invariably ends up with um, asphalt or concrete having to be uh, uh, very expensive to maintain it. Um, another one is that you have what's called the urban heat island effect. And this is a little bit more on the scientific side, but these large parking lots all across our country, uh, what they do is they tend to get extremely hot in the summertime. And what that does that adds to the heat uh, in our cities. And, it's, and it's, not, it's not minor, this is a huge thing. If you take every parking lot that's way over parking, way over done, and multiply that by hundreds of thousands of parking lots throughout the country, what you get is hundreds of thousands of acres of asphalt heating at 140 or 150 degrees in the summertime. And um, that causes much more cooling needed. Uh, it's more, uh, it's really hard on the environment. And what you get is a lot of dissolved solids that get into your uh, storm water. I could go on and on. Um, but what we did in the village, those of you who have been to the village, you know that there's not a lot of big parking lots, but there is sufficient parking. It's about timing and it's about where to look and, and changing a mindset as you go to the village. So there were a lot of people who were skeptical when we designed the Holiday Village that businesses would fail and the, and the village would not work because we limited parking stalls to about half of what we would do normally elsewhere. Uh, but it has not turned out to be the case. And we know both economically and scientifically uh, having more efficient parking is better than having parking design just for one or two um, big events. So I won't go on and on about that, but it is one of my favorite, uh, it's one of my favorite topics in urban planning is these parking lots are, are not, a, that are too big or not a good deal. And here's another reason why. If we had parked in the Holiday Village like the XL parking lot is designed, you wouldn't have a Holiday Village by creating so much area on a ground floor that is required for parking stalls, what you get is the inability to put more buildings up. You, you, you don't create rents. And it also has a, a very uh, bad effect on the, the, for the cost of housing, really raises the cost of housing. Um, and there's a whole science behind it. But so this zone, the Holiday Crossroads zone, the way it's been proposed is going to be parked Similarly, uh, if approved to the Holiday Village, it, you, you're looking for the Goldilocks uh, result, not too many, not too few, just right. And uh, what you're seeing is a lot of um, developments now are choosing to go with underground parking. Um, it's, it's a space saver, even though it is expensive, it tends to be a pretty good return on investment. So parking's a big deal, um, mixing of uses, the building heights, where the buildings are located, um, those kinds of things. Um, those are, it's kind of a, that's kind of the big picture view of the Holiday Crossroads. And if people have questions that we haven't touched on, let's hear them and we'll try to answer the best we can and get back to you. By the way, anybody who would like to contact us with specific questions, um, thank you, Stephanie. You can see that the email addresses are down here below uh, for both Rob Hobbs and I. And then 
Um, these dates are a little old, I should have updated those, but there is a public hearing continuing this Thursday. Um, and the link for getting onto that meeting is, is on the city's website. You just need to look for that prior to the meeting on Thursday. Oh, one other big thing that I failed to mention earlier, there's been some concern expressed by uh, some of the property owners and or business owners about when is all this going to happen? Well, the way this is being proposed is that the Holiday Crossroads Zone would, would be implemented upon the request of a particular property owner. So let's say the owner of the Excel uh, building and all of the parking around it. I don't know where exact property line is, but let's say they were proposing to do something um, different than what the current zone allows. They could approach the city council uh, after going through the planning commission and see if the council would be willing to let that happen there. But at the present time, it is not being proposed that the whole area down there is going to change zoning with one fell swoop. Um, that's really a decision uh, by the council, but until the zoning is adopted, it's, it will not be possible for the tall buildings to go in, the buildings closer to the street and everything else we've mentioned. That can only happen if the council approves the zone and then upon request by the property owner. Um, and and that's, the, that's the current plan. I mean, the council could change their minds about that in the future and allow the whole area to be zoned um, uh, you know, holiday crossroads zone at the same time. That's what we did with the village, but that's not what's being proposed here now. And that that's open for discussion, I think with our council. Um, I, I can keep going, but I think it's time to hear from you guys. I'm hopefully giving you enough information that you've got some good questions. Paul? Yes. We just need to remind people the next, the public hearing is the 21st. This week oh. is just a work meeting. So there is no public comment this week. Thank you for correcting me, Stephanie. My apologies to everybody. <laughs> and so it'll be a, a week from this coming Thursday. That should give everybody a little more time if they have questions to get those questions uh, to the staff and hopefully we can answer those if you'll. And of course you can call us at City Hall too. We haven't posted the, the number there, but uh, the main number for City Hall, if you wanted to get a hold of uh, Rob Hobbs or me, um, please do that. Um, okay, Paul, we yeah. need to kind of move along. We've got a question now. Yes. Yep. I'm ready. We're ready. Mr. Bateman, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry about that. How are you? Good. Good, Paul. Um, it's good to talk to you. Just yeah, good to talk to you again, Brent. Go um, ahead. I uh, just, um, I think you just answered my question, but I just want to reiterate to make sure I understand. This is a zone that's being created, but not necessarily applied. It's just being created to be available when the time is right. Is that, is that what you Yes, mean? yes. And, and, and one of the reasons for that is we have fragmented ownership over there, as you might, sometimes with a strip mall, you'll have one person who owns the whole center and they just lease all of the building space to different uh, tenants. Um, the Holiday Hills project, the old Cottonwood Mall, where you have a single owner who owns the entire project, you know, it sometimes, it, it doesn't make any sense to hold off on applying the whole zone at the same time, but you're right. Your question is right. And that is till the zone is adopted, it's not going to be applied as a whole. And um, it would require a property owner to ask for that zone change. Okay, and so we're not talking about an RDA or, or making a wholesale change to the area. It's just gonna be a particular owner wants to uh, do something different there. They apply for the change and this will allow them to do different things. Yeah, it's not an RDA. I mean, that hasn't really been discussed much. Uh, we do have a couple of RDAs around, but um, at this point in time, unless my memory serves me wrong, um, that's the case. Yep. Okay, great. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Brent. Good to talk to you again. Yep. Do we have anybody else out there that has any questions about the zone or anything? You know, people are, are very welcome to just send us their written comments too. They don't have to, you know, it doesn't have to be right now, but we'd certainly welcome 
phone conversations or a Zoom meeting. Um, we've got a lot more data. We've got other photographs. Um, there's other background information from the general plan too that we can make available. But Paul, if I could also comment that uh, <clears throat> there'll be the hearing uh, that will be held on the 21st of January at 6 p.m. at, at, at a continued public hearing. Uh, there will be at least uh, one more public hearing, perhaps more than one public hearing in February. Uh, I, I suppose it's possible the council could vote on this in the first meeting in February, although um, I'd, I think I'd be surprised if that happened. It probably is going to be voted on probably sometime in February or after, but yeah. it's not like there's any big hurry necessarily, especially with the winter months and COVID. So uh, there'll, be, there'll be more opportunities for people to give uh, public comments, which are very, very welcome by the city council. Thank you for that, Dan. And I'll just chime in too and say, we, we would love to hear from uh, business owners, tenants. Um, we've had quite a few of these events, um, but they never get old. Anytime we get a chance to speak directly to our residents or property owners to help clarify and build understanding, that's, that's the whole point of doing this. And then there's another good reason why we hold these events and take this input is because uh, we don't know everything. And so anybody who wants to read over the zone and might have a technical question, something that no one has addressed or, or, or thought about, that's really helpful. So we want people to check our homework, check our, uh, yeah, check our, excuse me, check our math, so to speak, um, and to see if there's something we've overlooked uh, that could be corrected or could be changed. And, and I'll just add to that, uh, I promise you the city council is persuadable uh, in fact, I don't think anyone on the council has made up his or her mind on this. Uh, and this is not a railroad <laughs> moving forward and with nothing to stop it. The, the council is very, very persuadable. Well, and to add to that, Dan, um, I think just to give you a little brief insight is that the planning commission, they took an extended period of time looking at this ordinance. So. For those of you out there who may not quite fully understand how the city works, uh, the Planning Commission, by law, has to look at this kind of thing and has to give a recommendation, thumbs up, thumbs down, or something in between to the City Council, because the Planning Commission does not make this law. They are not the legislative body, the Council is. But by law, the Planning Commission has to provide a recommendation. And our planning commission took their time with this. They looked at this very carefully. And uh, one of the things I would mention is that in terms of the discussion of height of buildings, there was some real debate on the planning commission about whether 65 was sufficient or was it way too tall? They debated this and it was, there was not a unanimity with the planning commission on the 65 feet figure. Um, there was there was some sharp disagreement, not uh, not harsh against each other, but there was a real divide on whether that was too tall or not. And in the end, there was a consensus to recommend it at 65. There were some who, some on the planning commission, who felt like you know this is kind of a go big or go home. We should definitely go for 65. We want to get as much out of this site as we can, create as much interest as we can. And there were others who said, well, let's make sure that this is not out of scale with uh, its surroundings. And let's make sure that this is something that we'll feel comfortable with the first time one of those tall buildings goes up. So um, they, they, uh, they, they were careful in their deliberations and uh, they didn't rush through this by any means. This process of the holiday crossroads zone, I think we're going on almost two years since we first started studying this. And we had a request by the proper, a particular property owner who said, we'd like to do something with our property. And he said, well, we don't have a vehicle for you. And they said, well, you guys create one. So we've been working on this for a long time. So a lot of thought and work have gone into this, but it's by no means a finished product. It's not perfect and uh, we need input. Hey, Paul, if I could follow up on that real quick and I don't wanna get into administrative stuff on your call, but I'd emailed you and Dan and I know we had a call set up tomorrow to address that very issue. I'm, 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 I'm really interested in hearing how that conversation went with the planning commission. And I don't see Lanise on this call, but 
if Dan has the time tomorrow, I wouldn't mind spending a little bit of time, me, you, Dan, and Lanise, and uh, pick your brain a little bit about how that discussion went with the Planning Commission, because it, it's my view there's some that there's some issues that that um, I think are going to be driven by Dan a lot in terms of just uh, crossing T's and dotting I's and cleaning up little issues that involve the zone in terms of rear setbacks and those sorts of things. But I think the height issue is going to be something that is is going to be really debated because um, I, I know for me I get that developers want as much height as, as they can get and I get the benefits to it, but I'm just concerned about the appropriateness of the height in that corridor in light of the fact that we're moving the buildings up to the road and what those visual perceptions are gonna be, not just as they relate to the, to the abutting residences, but also just the appropriateness of the height and, and where that lands. So if, if we could set up a Zoom call tomorrow at one and Dan could be in on that, Lenise could log in, I would love to explore that a little bit before we get to council meeting Thursday. Yeah, yeah, I'm planning on it. That's perfect. Um, if I could, I'd suggest also that Rob Hobbs be involved in that one. And I, I really think we'd probably uh, be silly to not include at least one planning commissioner uh, to kind of get their perspective. I mean, it's always... I, we always love to convey our perception of the meeting, but I, I think at this point in time, since their recommendation is already done, there's not a problem with having the, the, percep the actual opinions and feelings from at least one planning commissioner or two, so you can hear it straight from them. We're always, always, always a little nervous trying to <laughs> convey what we think, what we saw and heard, but if you don't mind, are either of you opposed to the idea of us inviting uh, a planning commissioner or two to give you their thoughts on this? I, I'm not. I, I, I'm just trying to educate myself as much as possible. And um, I think that's going to be a big issue. I think it's something that developers are going to be very interested in. I get it. Um, but I, I'm just curious to see. And that's why I've been asking about those building heights. Um, I was interested to hear that Rob said that that's actually 58 feet when I think on the uh, previous document that was forwarded, it was 48 feet. So, yeah. um, you know, that's an interesting bit of information. Um, yeah, and, the 48, uh, 58 was, my recollection was that that building on Vine was 48, but I wasn't surprised when it came back, you know, being 10 feet, 10 feet taller. Um, and likewise on the mall, the Macy's building, and this is an interesting thing in our discussion that we'll get into tomorrow, but there was discussion. The Planning Commission kind of did the same thing. They said, well, how tall are those buildings? Or how tall is this building? And we, we threw out some figures to say, well, it, compared to X, this is what's being proposed. And I had been told in no uncertain terms that Macy's was 65 feet. But I told Rob earlier today in an email when we were going through this, I said, that's what, was, that's what it was conveyed to me more than once by the same individual who's been working with... Um, uh, that property for a significant amount of time. But I told Rob earlier today, I said, I have a feeling it's not going to be quite that tall. And sure enough, when they went out to verify it, it was about six feet shorter. Um, so that's a chunk. It's about 10% difference than what I thought, what I was told versus what it actually is. So anyway. Yeah, 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 it Paul, kind of surprised Paul. me because it's only four stories. It's only four floors. And, you know, it typically like 10 feet of floor um, that seems 58 feet seems high to me, but you know, the math's the math. Yeah, the people tend to go with the taller ceilings, whether it's residential, you're now getting 10 foot ceilings, at least nine. And they have to figure the space between floors, usually talking about a foot and a half to two feet. And then when you have commercial on the bottom floor, you really tend to have at least a 13 foot ceiling height and a couple of feet. So if you have 15 for the first and then 11 to 12 thereafter, you come up with, you know, the mid fifties uh, for a four story building. And that's assuming that it has a flat roof. Most times you don't see a pitched roof on a building like that, but there is one in particular that you could put into your mind. And that is just west of the mall 
on Murray Holiday Road, there are those new apartment buildings that have been built, those brick ones that are kind of across from uh, Jiffy Lube down in that area, you know that building, um, the one that is a lot of people think is in Holiday. That building in particular raised a lot of eyebrows when it went up because it was significantly taller than the commercial center next door. But that's the trend, that's the way things are kind of going. And a, a local holiday builder, a developer, Ken Keller, he's the one who built that, so. Um, Paul, uh, Paul, one other question. Uh, do we have uh, either John or Rob Hobbs or someone, would it be possible to have some kind of a rendering that would show how tall a, a, a given X building at X height would be from, let's say from the street, from maybe, you know, from maybe north on the north on, um, you, know, you know, on the road north, on the road south, in, in looking across the street or from the neighborhoods. Is that how difficult? Perspectives. Yeah, perspectives, just so that you could yeah. see, okay, from the neighborhood, it's going to, you know, this exit, a building at X height will, will appear like this. Uh, I think that could be really helpful to the council. I know it was, for example, in uh, Cottonwood Heights City uh, did some renderings like that to, to answer that kind of question to their city council when they were looking at the, uh, the mall develop or the uh, gravel pit development that's going up there. And uh, it, it, it actually, resolved a lot of concerns of council members and in one or two cases raised them. But uh, that'd be really interesting to see what it would actually look like with say a 65 foot building or something lower. I don't know how difficult that is or if that's something John Tierlink could work magic on, but uh, that'd be interesting to see. We've had in the past, uh, uh, a couple of developers actually provide us with drawings like that because they know how important it is. Uh, it's one thing to say a building's gonna be you know, 50 feet tall, but you're right. Well, how will that look from 200 feet back? Um, so what I can do is I can reach out to um, the one property owner who is kind of the catalyst for all this to see if they've already done something like that. Um, on a very, it'd be very difficult to do you know, on such short notice, but we, I've seen those things. That, if you will recall, I know the mayor will, when the Holiday Hills project was being proposed by Ivory, um, what, a couple, three, two years ago now, remember they did that. They did a perspective on those buildings from several different vantage points. And it was very, very helpful to see what that building looked like. I remember distinctly remember that they did a perspective as if you were southbound on Highland Drive and you were coming up on that building um, some of you might remember that, but they actually did propose something like that. It takes a little more work, some software, um, but I think we could probably get something like that done, at least from that developer who, again, was kind of the catalyst for the whole thing. Let me see if they've got something on yeah. how that would look from at least a couple of different viewpoints. Well, I, that, for me personally, that'd be helpful. And again, this gets back to the earlier point that that uh, there really is not a, a rush on this. and even if it took uh, even if it took a few weeks or something to put something together, uh, it might be really really helpful to the council and to the public, especially to see what uh, what this might look like. You know that would have been helpful, I think, uh, along the way with the hotel project. By the way, we didn't touch on this yet, but we might just as a as something that would be useful. You know, the Fairfield Inn that's been proposed now down at the bottom of Highland Drive, literally just a stone's throw from the southern edge of the Holiday Crossroads District um, is being proposed at, you know, the mayor knows these figures as well as I do. It's 53 feet is the maximum for kind of their signature part of the building. Uh, it's 53 feet and then it drops down and the rest of the roof line, I think, is at 49. Um, and so there's a little bit of a pop up, but that get, and we've got some of those pictures but what we don't have is how that would look for those property owners directly to the east on the private lane. Uh, because those folks, trying to remember, I think they're about 140 feet, Dan, from the uh, western wall, the eastern wall of the hotel building. So 200 feet would push that back a little bit more. But again, numbers are just numbers. If Until you actually see it, it it's hard to do. So let me reach out to, um, that property, that one property owner, 
see if they've developed anything like that and ask them if they could put together um, perspectives from the roads from a couple of different vantage points. Let me see if they can do that. Um, yeah. That would help the discussion. Sure, it would. And, and in, fact that, in fact, something like that might be like a crucial for the, the council and the, the public to see before a vote is taken on it. And in fact, if I don't know what the, how the software works, but it might be nice to say, let's say the council said, no way we want to do 65. What would uh, 58 look like or 53? Or maybe the software is flexible enough that you could plug a different number in and get see what it would look like from different uh, heights. But uh, anyway, that's something we can talk about tomorrow. But I, yeah, I think, sorry, to, me... sorry, to, sorry to take up time on this meeting. This is probably not the, the venue for, for that to be raised, but uh, I, I like that idea. Well, I think for those who are listening, that might be really useful too. I thought I thought it was a great tool for the previous developer of the, the mall project to give those perspectives. Because some people were saying, you know, 100 feet or 120 feet, my gosh, it's, you know, skyscraper. And for others, it's like, well, that's not a problem at all. So it depends on your perspective, but unless you can actually see that perspective, you don't know. And you need to know the distance and the math that went into it. Um, so I'll reach out to see if we can get something done for that. And I think there was one other thing, but I'm, I'm drawing a blank. It was on the tip of my tongue a minute ago along this same line. I'm still open for questions. If anybody has one. Oh, one thing I was gonna mention earlier. Um, one of the beauties of this area, if you, if you will, is the, the canal. So there's the canal that's owned by Salt Lake City Public Utilities. And the city is, is looking at, at doing, uh, we're studying the possibility of trails along these Salt Lake City owned canals, property we don't own, but they have said that they would be willing to allow those to be used for walking trails, which is kind of a sidebar to this whole thing. But the whole thought of the, the, the canals is that that helps provide a buffer between the residential properties to the east, those neighborhoods to the east and to this property. And so, Kind of have to keep that in mind is that uh, if you if you if you think about how close a building is being proposed, you have to keep in mind that you have the backyard of the house to that property line, and then you have the canal property uh, as a kind of a buffer. And I think it's around sixty feet that right of way altogether. Dan, are you aware of that width? Does that sound about right? Yeah, I think so. It's okay, sixty. And so one thing in considering all this, as you get more into this discussion as a council, maybe you know next week, is where that setback is taken from. Is it taken from the eastern boundary of the commercial property, or is it taken from the western edge of what the canal has? So you have the property owner, so you got a property owner, and then you have the Salt Lake City Canal property, and then you have the backyard of the pro of the houses. So. It, this is where it could get really interesting is if you try to decide where that 200 feet is. It, again, is it from whose property line? Is it from the resident's property line? Because if not, then you would add 60 feet to that potentially, and that would take it even further back. So that's just one thought to keep in mind because that could play a huge difference. That was one question I was gonna have, Paul, and maybe this is better for Thursday, but I know we've talked about an easement being 50, feet from the center line of the canal, but it talks about in, in, in the zone, a 20 foot setback from the top of bank. So, you know, um, I'm just kind of curious how those two things intermingle, but we can talk about that. That's not a topic for here. I don't think that's technical stuff. Yeah, I wanted to throw that out though as kind of food for thought because it could make a significant difference on Where's the starting point? Just like it is on setbacks or roof heights or other things. You know, the devil is in the details on some of these things. And so if the desire to build a little bit more distance is in there, then you could change where the starting point is measured from. But I'll see if I can get some perspectives, at least from that building that's being proposed or that, that tentative plan for that building. And, uh, and we can go from there. Okay, I think we're way off track and we don't have any more questions. So I think we will just end it for now and start again with the six o'clock session. Very good. Thanks, everyone. See you tomorrow at one.
Now, I think we're going to stay in line and talk with Stephanie oh. for a minute. Yeah, okay. Glad I didn't leave. Okay, I sent you guys another Zoom link because I can't do it. It'll still keep the people on. So I sent you another link for the next part of our meeting. Perfect. Okay, thanks. Is that it? So yeah. we're jumping off and coming back on? Yes, with a link I sent you. Yeah, so we'll, okay. we'll, see, we'll see you then at six o'clock. No, no, we're gonna, we're gonna have another meeting right now, aren't we? Oh, Stephanie? another meeting right now, I got gotcha. you, okay. So check your link and we'll jump back on to have some discussion. Oh, gotcha, okay, got it.